Miss Megan McEwen is a leading clinical exercise physiologist based in Auckland Central, but often traveling beyond to visit clients in need. Megan has owned and directed her own business since 2012 and has been in the industry as a clinical manager and rehabilitation practitioner scientist since the profession's infancy in New Zealand for more than 15 years. Megan is, public, is a published author in a range of scientific journals and is also a registered postgraduate student research supervisor at a local tertiary institute. This position allows her to stay updated with current medical, scientific, and exercise research, which she can academically analyze and put back into her business to help her client. Megan works with a wide range of illnesses, her specialized fields, and areas that she is most passionate about are in helping those with invisible illnesses. These include those with psychological distress, including depression, anxiety, stress, and burnout, and mismanaged chronic pain and fatigue conditions, including somatoform disorders, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, and central sensitization disorders. So good morning everyone, thank you Chris. Um, my name is Megan McEwen and I'm an exercise physiologist here in Auckland. So this means that I'm specially trained in exercising those with medical conditions. So unlike um, your well-known personal trainers um, who work with healthy groups only or should be only working with healthy groups or your physios who work primarily with acute injuries and diagnosis, I work at the other end of the spectrum, so your chronic illnesses. So it is a research-based industry um, using the medical literature to, um, to form our prescriptions, and it's a postgraduate qualification as well, so as opposed to a lot of the ex other exercise professions which aren't. So in my time when I was studying, all our base papers were shared with the medical profession as well, so the likes of you guys. Um, our specialist papers were just in the exercise sciences, and further, all my electives were in the psychology realm, um, and all my research and projects were on the functional disorders. Um, so the more I worked with these functional disorders, um, the more I noticed the strong relationship with mental health coming out, um, and the more I realised that when you exercise with these people, that it was just it was having more effect than just the there was so much more to the exercise basically. Um, and what I offered also seemed to be a little bit unique, and I was often achieving results that my colleagues weren't. Um, so now I would almost call myself a specialist in functional disorders as opposed to calling myself an exercise physiologist or exercise specialist. Um, so just like you lot would use a scalpel, for example, for cutting to get your job done, even though the desired outcomes may be a little bit different and you've got a range of tools on your side, um, my primary tool is exercise, um, even though I also have a selection of tools that I can bring about for um, a range of different disorders as well. So most of my work is referral based through private insurance groups and associated providers and I work mostly with these functional disorders as well. So these manifest um, themselves most with, mostly with the symptoms of pain and fatigue as Chris has already talked about. Um, you often get the sporadic vomiting, nausea, dizziness, chronic sore throat, um, you get a lot of the, the brain fog um, and they often describe themselves as being um, kind of almost in a bubble and kind of removed from the world. So, but what we're really working with, so these people are angry, they're frustrated, they're scared, they feel unheard, um, they're fear avoidant with poorly managed illness beliefs and they lack acceptance of their condition. So these patients are people who believe that nobody gets me, um, no one has what I do, I'm different, um, something physical is wrong with me and no one is good enough to know what it is. So the reason I have these things up there is to give you an indication of the obstacles that we're actually um, coming across when it comes to treatment. Um, and these are actually the behavioral characteristics that I use to inform my process. So when it comes to the assessment, so depending on where the client is based, um, I will let them choose where we'd like to meet, whether that be at a gym, at home, at a cafe, um, at their own clinic. So this is often, it gives me a good gauge of where they're actually at in terms of exercise and whether they're a believer right from the get-go. So, and right from the start, I'm trying to reduce their anxieties about exercise. So a lot of physiologists these days, they're heavily focused on testing. Um, I'm not, and that's because I actually know my population. 
So the testing I do do is all reliable and valid and based on our exercise bible. Um, but there's often other overriding psychological factors that actually need, need to be taken into consideration first before that vigorous testing is even performed. So assessments can take anywhere between 1.5 to 2.5 hours. Um, so with the functional, or people with these functional disorders, um, they tend to have a lot to say and they just want someone to listen. So I generally allow this because that's getting me my buy-in right there and it's allowing me to establish that rapport with them. And having this increases your chance of success. And um, not only have I learnt a lot also about them, um, but I've also given them what they're after in a provider as well. So on top of this, I'm also assessing week by week anyway when I'm meeting with them. So I'm tracking outcomes, their symptoms, their triggers, their perceptions, so all these sorts of things. And these changes are far more important as opposed to your one-off pre or post assessment. Um, and which given the slow progress of these conditions, um, they don't always show drastic changes in these physical measures anyway. So after that, um, I basically compile all the findings. I put that into a written report. Um, so then we get down to the prescription and supervision. So my program is slightly different um, to other providers in that I encourage independence as well. So my plan is to teach patients actually how to look after themselves and make their own decisions. And we practice those, once they've made those decisions, we actually practice them together. So with these um, conditions, no prescription or the justification for is ever the same. Um, and I also know that when exercising is just simply too much and I may need to take advantage of other things in their lifestyle to try and build their capacity. So just like you lot wouldn't ask your patients to overdose on medication, I don't ask my patients to overdose on exercise either. And a reason I find I'm somewhat successful at what I do um, is people tend to relax with me. So. I'm exercise, and with that becomes a certain perception that I'm a bit of a meathead, um, you know, I'm all about fun, and doing heaps of press-ups and that, that sort of thing. Um, however, this means that people are also initially quite scared to meet me. However, when they do, they realise that that's not me at all, um, and they'll often find that they'll get a lot more from me. So the more they give, they give me, the more they actually get out of me, and I feel that I kind of get these people. Um, so I'm also a constant in their life, so I don't turn on them when, all these, when their times get tough or they speak badly to me, because I can do. Um, I get why they do it. I stay and I support them and I provide that rational advice. And I keep them accountable and I constantly follow them up. And I find that's what a lot of surfaces just simply don't have the time for, but because I know it's so important with these disorders, I make sure that it is included. So there is a method that works, um, that provider-patient relationship, that provider-patient relationship um, is paramount. And that's a really important point that I would like to get across today, that the person you choose needs to be right for the job with these functional disorders. So as part of my service also comes an education program, so both with information relevant to their condition as well as a separate group of info that actually takes them through all the exercise components. So it comes with weekly activities and then we can either talk, um, talk them through together or they can do them independently as well. So the intention again of this program is that I have them walking away knowing how to manage this on their own and this also gives the client the control that they're after and that they also need to get them back on their feet. So is exercising safe for this population? Yes, 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 yes. It's safe if it's done right. Um, and this is why I've given you a bit more of a thorough breakdown of my background and how it's not just the prescription, but it's also about the provider as well. So, so much evidence in the literature these days is pointing to patient-centred care and the importance of the patient being involved in the decisions and the rehab. So, if they don't like you, if they don't trust you, or if they don't believe you, they will often not adhere. So these patients are not always um, easy people to work with. Um, they've been through a lot, so it's understandable. So they will challenge you and they'll call you up on things and they will notice if you're not comfortable with the conversation and then ultimately the trust won't be built and nor they even attempt the regime because you personally recommended it. So I've noticed that in what I've done before. So the other thing is if you give them something too hard, they just simply won't come back. So exercise is such a fragile treatment um, when working with these psychosomatic populations. So you have one chance to do it right. So I'd almost recommend you get someone who knows what they're doing right from the get-go, as opposed to sending them to a gym and just hoping, oh, she'll be right. 
Um, the amount of people I've treated who have already been through multiple exercise services without benefit, um, it's, it's just incredible. So on a side note, if they do have comorbidities, which again is quite common, um, then you also need someone who is qualified in prescribing in those fields. So there can be risks with exercising, um, depending on the condition. So your best bet is to refer to a physiologist um, who can solve that puzzle for you. So the exercise recommendations for health benefits. So believe it or not, it's actually about 11.5 hours a week once you include all your aerobic, your resistance, and a bit of flexibility training as well. So it's hard enough to exercise when we're healthy, as we all probably know, particularly with the time constraints, with our families, with our exceptionally busy jobs like you lot, um, and especially if you don't even like it. So now imagine if you had a health condition whereby every time you moved, because you became nauseous or you felt like you'd been hit by a bus afterwards. Um, how would you like to be exercising then? You probably wouldn't be. So these people are dealing with a lot of the same um, barriers as we already are, um, plus symptoms. So why on earth in their spare time would they want to be doing something that brings them more discomfort? So let alone to meet that 11.5 hours a week. And that's a really interesting thing. While there are some minor changes to these recommendations for various clinical conditions, um, they're still largely targeted to achieving this quantity of exercise, um, and that's including for the functional disorders as well. And I understand why these recommendations are in place and how they've come about, um, but the thing you need to know with functional disorders, you have to take these recommendations with a grain of salt. And you'll only know that if you've done plenty of exercise with these groups. Um, and I'm telling you now, next to no one would be achieving that quantity per week because it equates up to about 45 minutes a day or something ridiculous. So you've also got to consider that as pointless prescribing a program um, that meets these recommendations if they simply won't do it. So this is where having a provider, again, that understands more than just the exercise recommendations is so, so important. So the importance of exercise. So we all know exercise improves fitness and strength and it reduces your chance of certain cancers and improves your cardiovascular disease and a hundred of other really awesome things. But so what? That's not why I prescribe. I prescribe to return these guys to living their life, basically, um, and targeting a lot of the, um, the things that we see here on the left. So it's about figuring out how to manipulate the exercise variables to improve this, these myriad of symptoms that they're having trouble with. So you actually fit the program to the symptoms and not the other way around. So the importance of exercise, it's actually largely in the process. So there's so much benefit for the patient in organizing a program and carrying it out. So it provides daily routine, you've got, it encourages planning, decision making, um, it gets them socially active or, um, you know, getting them back into a gym and things like that. Um, and the list just continues, basically. However, it is extremely confronting. Um, if done incorrectly and they struggle to adhere, it can lead to feelings of guilt, reduced confidence, um, feelings of failure, all the things you really, really want to avoid in these populations. So that's also why it's good to have someone complete the first few sessions with them. So you can basically talk about these things as they're happening. And it's never as easy as just simply telling someone to go for a run. So please never just say that to them. So what other clinicians, well, what I often hear clinicians say. So in the early days when I did start this profession, um, exercise was still strongly advised against by health professionals. And that's a really challenging position to be in. So not only is your client unconvinced that the treatment's gonna work, but when the other clinicians or the other treating clinicians also agree. So it's not always surprising when I get a call from their treating clinicians asking why their patient is in pain and checking that I'm not some exercise hooligan that's just telling them to go out and do whatever they like. So a lot of the comments that I, well, I have received in the past, it's, oh, it's just exercise. Those trainers only know about muscles and what exercise work them. In some instances, that might actually be the case. So please do your homework before referring. Um, pick up the phone and talk to the clinician and choose someone who does have plenty of experience with these functional disorders. There's not a lot of us. Um, another comment is, I, my patient is in pain. You shouldn't be exercising someone with a pain or fatigue condition. It's exercise. They're gonna get uncomfortable. Um, it's temporary, it's normal, and it's safe. So how else are they really supposed to progress? So it's like if I asked you guys to go out and do um, something you've never done before, or, or even doing it after years of inactivity, um, you'll no doubt have the same response. 
So another comment is it's far too much exercise or this is far too little exercise. So before putting exercise down as it's not working or saying that it's too much or too little to your patient, please talk to me first. So there could be a message I'm giving within my prescriptions. So everything is thought out down to the wriggle of their toes when I prescribe my programs. And this is where the teamwork side of it is essential with these patients. So having your, your guys' support is, is gospel. So when all clinicians are talking and supporting a consistent plan, success is far more likely and the patient will also feel a lot more confident in their progress as well. So I know a lot of what I'm suggesting today sounds really, really basic, but it's amazing how many people just don't quite get it, and a lot of exercise people get it wrong. Um, so your, your sincerity and your encouragement is key with these sensitive fellas, so they can smell a rat from a mile away. So when to prescribe exercise? As soon as a patient walks into your, into your office, uh, exercise is good for everyone, as we know. Um, so as soon as you find out that someone has a functional disorder, uh, as soon as you identify mismanaged symptoms, so that's the crashing or an inability to complete everyday tasks, so maybe they're not, no longer going to work. So as soon as you notice things are spiralling down and or they're out of options and there's no other um, providers on board to actually help with that. As soon as you notice your boom bust patterns, um, so that stays in bed following days of activity. Um, and as soon as you notice avoidance behaviours or growing illness beliefs, so those are the, I'm never going to get better and I can't do that anymore, those sorts of things. And the sooner exercise is part of a treatment plan, the sooner these people will actually be on their feet, back on their feet. So if you are prescribing exercise, so it's important that you build that rapport early and gain their trust. Um, be flexible but consistent with your message. So use exercise from a psychological perspective, so their, their perspective. Jump in their shoes. Find out what floats their boat, so what they're interested in. Give them the most achievable and likely option. Give them the opportunity to come up with the idea, so plant seeds to try and guide them and allow them ownership of the plan as well. Start with high frequency and low session volume. And aerobic exercise, because it's probably the mostly researched as well, um, it does tend to come out as being the most beneficial for these conditions, but just be wary because it's often the less, less manageable as well. Get them exercising without them thinking about it. So that's walking, your kids, walking the kids to school, doing a supermarket run. Um, just don't allow the exercise to become a chore because that gets into another territory. And remember, it's about the human, not just the body it's in. So their happiness and comfort is actually key as well. To help with um, any prescriptions, we have actually been working on an instruction pamphlet, um, which will be on my website in the coming weeks. And this will come with a whole bunch of other information and resources to guide you. So um, make sure you check these out as well. So what to expect when um, your patients start exercising? So starting exercise, it's not easy. The concept is, the reality really isn't. Um, it's also a lifestyle change and successful behaviour change. It's complex and multifaceted, as we all know. So expect temporary increases in symptoms. Uh, expect it to be confrontational. Um, expect barriers, excuses, obstacles, um, all leading to avoidance. So there'll be 101 reasons not to follow your suggested plan even if they've come up with the idea themselves. So expect boom bust patterns, um, expect for them to hit a wall after a few weeks. Um, it can take months to progress them and for them to perceive um, any benefit. And expect each patient to respond very differently as well. And if a medical provider is on board, expect to stay in close contact with them. So when to refer. So as soon as the patient tells you they're not exercising, despite your best efforts, uh, when, the, when you're met with patient resistance, I love those ones, <laughs> um, it doesn't excuse them if they don't believe in exercise, so still refer them. If you don't have capacity to give them the attention they will need, and if they refuse to medicate, also get them exercising. So as much as you lot all may know, and as great as you're all in your profession, you can't, you can't do it all on your own, and often what these patients need is yet another provider reinforcing the same thing, um, and having someone who can hone in on their specialist area of management um, leaves you guys to do what you, you're all best at. So the take home messages for today, so exercising is safe when you have a functional disorder, remember that one please? <laughs> um, exercise is effective if done properly, um, so those with functional disorders respond to exercise just like any of us, um, but the way that you achieve that is what is actually important. So exercise is so much more than just building strength and fitness, the exercise process is just as important in influencing a person's perceptions of their symptoms. 
listen carefully to what they tell you. So involve your patient in the decisions and be sincere. And your choice in clinician is paramount. Teamwork, essential. Uh, remember sometimes you have to be firm to be kind, so they are gonna get a little bit of pain or fatigue, whatever the symptoms are. And it's about the human, not just the body it's in. And if they believe they are better, then you have quite simply succeeded. And that's me, thank you.